But tonight we're going to go back into relationships. And last week we talked about this intimacy topic, which is such a big one. We talked about it from the perspective of a child wanting to connect, needing to connect, driven to connect, like all of us are. It's built into us, but weren't able to connect because parents were either abusive, absent, neglectful, or they abandoned us. And so a child grows up without having connected or attached, and they don't feel like they fit in or belong, and they develop what we call technical terms, attachment disorders. And that's what we looked at last week, and most of you could relate, and most of you felt guilty about what you've done to your kids already. So what I want to do tonight is build the next block on this intimacy topic. A lot of people, when they hear intimacy, is just give me tools so I know how to connect. What you have to understand is there's a bigger picture. You can't connect with anybody, truly connect in a healthy way, unless you feel safe with that person. And that is really a huge issue, and that's why I want to talk about it tonight, because complex trauma is growing up in an environment where you don't feel safe. Mom or dad or both aren't safe people. And so you walk on eggshells, you live in fear, you can't connect with them because if you connect with an unsafe person, you're going to get hurt. And so you go through life not connecting, afraid to connect, but wanting to connect. And the problem is that you build all these ways to try to protect yourself, but then you get into adult life and it's not working anymore. And it's because certain things from childhood took root in you that you're not even aware of that set you up to find unsafe people. And that is, for many of you, there's a need from your childhood for chaos. You hate it, but it's your normal. And so you seek out chaos without even realizing you're doing it at a subconscious level, and that involves unsafe people Or, subconsciously, you're attracted to unsafe people because that's who you've always had in your life and that's your normal. And so you get hurt and hurt and hurt. And then, because that's all you've had role modeled for you, that's all you've experienced, you then become unsafe yourself. And that is very tragic when it comes to being unsafe to your own children. And so now you repeat in the next generation what you grew up with and your children don't feel safe with you. So I want you to understand or think about recovery this way. True recovery will only happen if I have safe people in my life. As long as I have unsafe people in my life, I will be in survival mode and I won't be able to grow and that will stunt my growth. So recovery requires building a surrogate family of safe people and then recovery requires becoming safe myself. So it's all about being with safe people and becoming a safe person. I think one way you can look at a definition of love when it comes to your own children is I love my children when I am determined to become a safe person for them. And I'm willing to change however I need to change so that my children have a safe person in me. So what does it mean to be a safe person? And that's what I want to talk about. Eight different characteristics that make a safe person. And one way that you can look at this is just being safe for my partner because you can't have healthy, deepening intimacy in any relationship unless both people are safe. But more than that, I can't trust anybody if they're not safe. So your trust issues are tied to finding a safe person. And I can't be 
a good friend or find a good friend unless they're safe. So I need to know what makes a person safe so that I can begin choosing healthier friends. So that's where we're going to go. So number one, to be safe, I have to live with a moral compass or by a moral code. So think of it this way. If you are with a person that lies to you all the time, you don't feel safe with them because you're not sure what to believe. Or if you're with a person who just wears masks and they're not genuine, they're fake, they're phony, you don't feel safe because you don't know if you're getting the real thing. And if you're with a person who's a hypocrite, they talk great but don't live it, you don't feel safe with them. So to feel safe, that person has to be honest, not just in what they say, but in what they do. They're genuine. They live what they talk. Then you go, okay, now I feel safe. Because if a person is dishonest, you could get hurt at any time. And that makes them unsafe. Secondly, they need to have a sense of responsibility within their moral compass. So that means if they make a promise, they keep it. If they make a commitment, they keep it. If you have a person that makes promises and breaks them all the time, they're not a safe person. Because you could be putting your hope in their promise and then they let you down and you get hurt. So that is a big thing. But more than that, just keeping your promise, a responsible person, they do the right thing whether they feel like it or not. So they might get up in the morning and go, oh, I'm so tired today, but ignore that because I got responsibilities I have to do whether I'm tired or not. That makes a safe person. A person that just goes with how they're feeling, so I'll love you and be nice to you if I feel like it, but if I'm cranky, I'm going to be spiteful and disrespectful. That's not a safe person. So a safe person sticks to their moral code even on days they don't feel like it. That's what makes them safe. And then they understand what needs they have in their own life that only they can meet. And they meet them. They don't walk around to every woman saying, only, only you can meet my needs, please let me kind of lean on you and you take care of me and let me be a little kid and you be my mummy. That's not a safe person. That's a wear you out sick person. So you need a responsible person. Then they need to have respect as one of their moral commitments. They will respect you, treat you with respect, not put you down, not try to humiliate you. They will respect your boundaries. So if you say no, they'll respect that. They won't keep trying to push, push until they get their own way. So if a person doesn't respect boundaries, you don't feel safe with them. As soon as you see that person around, you want to go to a different room because you know they're going to be pushing to get what they want. That's not a safe person. <clears throat> but it goes even deeper than that. All of us realize we live with our dark side. So inside of us are these very strong drives, desires that can take us to a very bad place. So if we give in to our anger, if we give in to our fear, we can do a lot of damage. If we just let our sex drive go crazy, we can do a lot of damage. So we got all of those things inside of us. If we get hurt and we just want revenge no matter what, all of those make us unsafe. So a safe person says, I will have internal boundaries that keeps those drives under control. So if I'm with a person and I get angry, I won't lash out. If I'm with a person and the old sex drive kicks into gear, I will keep that under control. Because if I don't keep those under control, I become a very unsafe person. So there's an inner strength 
that comes from being committed to living by those morals. And then there's that moral code that says, I'm going to do right even if my friends aren't doing it. I will resist peer pressure to do what I know is wrong. If you have a friend or you're a person who just does whatever your friends do and they do stuff that is dishonest and hurtful and you go along because you don't want them to make fun of you, you've become an unsafe person. So at the very root of being safe to your kids, to everybody, there's got to be a moral compass that you're committed to. Next one. A safe person is a humble person. A person with a big ego out of control where it's all about them is very unsafe. What I mean by humility is a safe person says, I'm willing to look at my stuff and own it. I want to change. I'm not going to be blaming people. I'm not going to be looking for excuses. I'm not going to be rationalizing wrong behavior. I want to change and get healthier and healthier. And that means I'm willing to take input from others. Even if I feel a little stupid for having to do it. Even if I feel a little embarrassed that i got to ask somebody younger than me for some help. But I want to get healthy so badly that I am willing to own my stuff and be teachable and to take input. That is a requirement of a safe person. Number three, a safe person is a consistent person. If one day you say, here's the rules, here's where I draw a line in the sand, and you keep that for a day and then the next day it shifts. That means that everybody around you doesn't know what the rules are on any given day. And if one day you say to your kids, if you do that, you're grounded, and they, you follow up, and then the next day they do it again and you don't ground them, you take them out for an ice cream cone, they go, we don't know which way, what's happening on any given day. And so they live with this insecurity of, what's mom going to be like today? And they learn to read that, So they know how to live inside of that and so they know how to manipulate it. So that makes it you a very unsafe person. Number four, a safe person is not a manipulator. And a safe person isn't a control freak. Do you realize that anybody that resorts to manipulation is unsafe? Because they're always working you with a hidden agenda They always are using you, and you're going to get hurt. Manipulation makes a person very unsafe. A control freak, you better do the way they want, or they're going to hurt you. They're unsafe. So that means then that a healthy person expresses their needs and their desires. They stand up for themselves, but then... If the other person doesn't want to cooperate and meet that need, they're not going to try to manipulate them. They're not going to try to go into control freak mode. They're going to respect that. So they deal with that very important thing of expressing their needs but not manipulating to get their needs met. Now let me just take that into parenting. Most of you have children. So what does that mean as a parent? Does that mean I say to my kids, I need you to be quiet, and then I just sit back and let them yell all they want? No, as a parent, when the kids are really young, you are in control. It doesn't mean you're in a control freak, though some are, but it means that you have to be in control because they can't do anything for themselves. But, As a parent, as the child gets older, you give up control more and more. You let them make more and more of their own decisions. You still set boundaries. You enforce consequences if they don't follow it because you are still the authority in the house. And so that's parenting. So what is very difficult for many people from complex trauma is once the kids get into their teens, is to start 
letting the kids have more control because the fear is they're going to make a bad decision. And they might go down the same path as I did. So I better go into control for, excuse me, control freak mode. And that does a lot of damage. So a healthy person sets boundaries, sets consequences to boundaries, express their needs, but they're willing, as their children get older, to let them learn some lessons by failure. And that hurts as a parent, and you want to rush in and rescue them, but you know for yourself, there's, only, there's some lessons that you only learn the hard way, through failure, and we have to let our children go through that. And then, I think it's very important that you understand that giving up control to your kids or giving them more control is very much a gradual line that progresses as they age. So it's very age dependent. So you don't say to a one-year-old, you got to cook your own meals today and take out the tr trash and mow the lawn. That is not appropriate for that age. So you make sure that it's age appropriate. Number five, safe people regulate their emotions. So if I'm feeling a whole lot of anxiety, I don't go and spread it to everybody so that they feel the same anxiety. If I'm angry, I don't lash out at everybody. I can regulate those emotions. That is so important because for a person from trauma, what scares them, maybe more than many other things, or triggers them, it's when somebody's not regulating their emotions. So their anger's out of control, they're on a hissy fit, their fear is out of control, and they're creating chaos and crisis. And you go, stay away from that person. They are not safe. So that is one of the most difficult things to learn in becoming a safe person. So what we say, technical term for complex trauma, is emotional dysregulation. Which means they're not very good at regulating emotions because they were never given the tools. And so for you as a parent to be safe to your kids, it's going to be really important to learn to regulate your emotions. That means when you're angry, you don't go on a yelling fit with them and threaten them and go all kinds of places, or when you're really full of fear, you don't make them feel it by you getting all control freak because of it. You regulate it. Now let me say a couple other things. Part of this emotional regulation as a parent is, part of parenting is you put your own emotional problems on the back burner sometimes, so you can be there for your kids. That is so important to do. Now that doesn't mean that you never show any emotions to your kids. There are times when your kids need to see you cry, they need to see you upset and angry, but you're managing it in a healthy way. And you're, when they say, are you okay mom or dad, when you're crying, you go, yeah, give me a hug, but I, I'm okay. I'm just sad right now. And you talk about it. That, for a child, can just help them feel connected to you. Because you're being real. And you're letting them into your world. Now, that doesn't mean you run to them every time you're crying and make them the shoulder you cry on. You have to have discretion there. But it is important to put emotions at times on the back burner and at other times let your children into your emotional world. Children will sense if you are leaning on them too much to be your rock. And that can do damage. So just be aware of that. Number six. A safe person validates and encourages and appreciates the people around them. 
Most of you grew up in homes where there is much more negative talk than positive, encouraging, validating talk. And you know that when there's a lot of criticism and there's not much encouragement or nurture, you don't feel safe. Because it doesn't matter what you do, you're afraid you're going to get criticized or put down. So what has to happen in a healthy home, again, as parents, is you want an environment that is more positive than negative. You want to be giving your children validation and encouragement and appreciation for stuff that they do more than criticism. That makes them feel safe. That is very important. Number seven. In order for a child to feel safe, in order for others to feel safe, they need to know somebody gets them. Somebody understands them and wants to understand them. And they need somebody to be open with them. So it goes two ways. So part of what many parents have done that you grew up with is they never tried to understand your world. They just tried to make you do what they wanted you to do. So you felt, why don't they get me? Why don't they want to understand me? And it hurt. And you walked on eggshells because it feels very unsafe when nobody understands you. And so as a parent today, enter into the world of your children. Now, this is difficult for many guys because we want all our kids to throw a football or a baseball. That's how we're going to enter into their world. If our child says, Dad, have a tea party with me, we go, oh, no. But we got to move out of our comfort zone into their comfort zone. And that is difficult, but very important. And then... I had, some of my children were snugglers. Some had a bubble this big. They didn't want to get hugged. They didn't want to get a good night kiss or that. It was, night dad, bye. Part of me just wanted to hold them and force them to accept a hug. But I knew that would push them further away. But some parents want to hug their kids not for the benefit of the child, but for their own benefit. And so getting your kids is learning their personality. Are they snugglers? Are they not? Do they need more space than the other ones? I need to know that. Some are very verbal. Some are very active. Some are very emotional. Understand. Understand their dreams, their hopes, what they like to think about in their head. All of that is very important. And be a good listener. Don't be on your phone after you ask your kids, how was your day? Don't go back to your phone. Give them your full attention. I had to watch one day. Our daughter, our daughter Brienne, in Germany had a little one-year-old on her knee. And she was sitting on her knee looking this way. But as soon as my daughter's chin was on her head, as soon as she felt my daughter's chin turn to talk to me or Kim, she put her hand up and straightened her head back out. Because she says, I want your attention. And I'm alert right now. If you divert your attention to somebody else, I don't like that. And your children all have messages that will send that to you. Final one, become a nurturer and a comfort. Your children will cry. Your children will hurt. Your children will have bad days. If they come to you and you say, get over it. If they come to you and say, come on, grow up. Don't make such a big deal out of it. You're not safe. Because they need comfort. Now there's times kids are crybabies and you have to say, smarten up. Because they're just trying to manipulate you with tears. But often you know when that is. But when they're really in raw pain, be there for them. Now let me qualify that. 
Some of you say, I'm there for my kids, but what you are there for is to fix your kids so that they stop crying now. Because your tears make me uncomfortable, so I'm going to fix you. And your kid's saying, why didn't you stop to find out more about my pain? Why are you so quick to just want me to stop pain? So again, you got to move out of your comfort zone and you got to enter their world and you got to not just pat them on the back, but you got to ask questions that explore that world. That's comforting them. Then they feel heard. Then they feel cared for. Then you're safe. Eight very, very key things. Now what I hope you are getting as I went through that, you can't be those eight things unless you deal with a lot of stuff. Those eight things don't just happen because you read a book or you heard me talk. Those eight things, you got to deal with your boundary issues. You got to deal with your shame issues. You got to deal with your needs for validation. You got to deal with all your triggers and your emotional world. That's a lot of work. So understand this. You're not going to be very unsafe today and be safe tomorrow. You're going to start a process of becoming safer. And what I want you to understand is if your children or people in your life see that you're becoming safer, that's good enough for them. They're happy with that. Some are going to wait till you get quite safe because you've hurt them so much. But they're excited and grateful when they see you owning your stuff and becoming safer. And then they'll start to connect to you a little bit. Not at the depth that you might like, but a little bit than the way it used to be. And then you build off of that. And then a year down the road, you could have a wonderful relationship. So don't expect instant success. Don't beat yourself up if you don't get there tomorrow. But enter the journey and know that people, little eyes, other people are watching and noticing. And they will start responding as you get it become a safer, safer person. person. And then, I'll restate what I started with. You cannot have a deepening, healthy, intimate relationship unless both are safe. It's not good enough to just have one who's safe. Both have to be safe. So if you're in an intimate relationship, I hope both of you see the need to work on becoming safer, or else you'll never deepen in that relationship. I think my favorite type of preaching is two types. One is telling Bible stories, and the other is explaining Bible history and culture, and I get to do both tonight. We've been talking about relationships and this part in reference to a relationship with God, and how for many people, the thought of a relationship with God just freaks them out, and they think either God wouldn't want a relationship with me, or I'm not sure I want a relationship with that God if He's like the God I heard about growing up. And so we've been trying to work through all of that. Two weeks ago, we saw that what makes up a relationship with God is that I grow in my trust of God, and I trust Him more and more with my life, or step three, turning my will and my life over. What I got thinking what I want to talk about tonight is a person coming out of complex trauma, they don't trust, you know that, <clears throat> but instead of trusting, they manipulate. <clears throat> I, I've dealt with quite a few hustlers in my life, and basically it's a person that gets their needs met by working other people. And they're always working other people. So their game is always on. They're always in manipulation mode. Those kind of people, why bother learning to trust 
I'm such a good manipulator. I don't need to learn to trust. Well, then they don't have a relationship with God. And they say, I'll have a relationship with God as long as I can manipulate God to do what I want. And so they take courses on how to have prayers that manipulate God. How do you have a real in, intimate relationship with God if you spent your whole life manipulating and hustling? What does God have to do to get a person like that to the place where they finally surrender and trust Him? That is the question I want us to think about. And there happens to be a guy in the Bible who was a hustler, who was very good at it, became one of the wealthiest men around because he was a master manipulator. And the Bible, from the second it introduces us to him, highlights that fact. And it emphasizes it as it follows his life along in the Bible because he wants to show us what had to happen in that man's life to bring him to the place of surrender and trust. His name is Jacob. If you're not familiar with him, if you're familiar with this guy named Abraham, Abraham was the guy God said, I'm going to make out of you a great nation, and the Messiah is going to come from your descendants. Abraham then was the father of the nation of Israel today. He had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had his name changed to Israel. And that's where Israel, the nation, comes from, is this guy, Jacob. So let me give you a little bit of quick overview. So father, J or Isaac, mother, Rebecca. In the family... Father favored one son, which was Jacob's twin brother, Esau. Rebekah favored Jacob. So you already got some stuff going on in the family. Mother, Rebekah, comes from a family of manipulators. So she's all about manipulation, and she passes it to her son. Now the name Jacob means one who grabs the heel. And the reason he was given that name is he was a twin. And Esau was born first, and he came out grabbing Esau's heel. And so he is called Jacob, the one who grabs the heel. How would you like that for a name? But what's significant is in that culture, one who grabs the heel was also a figure of speech for a manipulator. So they don't deal with you straight face. They're always trying to trip you up. They're grabbing you at the heel and they're playing their little secret ambush type games to manipulate you. So the fitting name of Jacob is Master Manipulator. And he lived with that name. And he lived it out in his life. So I want to very quickly kind of take you through his first two major manipulation schemes. Esau, even though he was like 30 seconds older, was the oldest son, which means he would get two-thirds of the inheritance and Jacob would get one-third. Well, Jacob was pissed off about that. So he says, I want the money. I want the birthright. I want the inheritance. How do I manipulate my brother to give it to me? So his brother Esau loved the outdoors. He was a hunter. And Jacob was a mummy's boy. And he loved staying at home. One day Esau had been on a hunting trip. And he came back and he hadn't got one thing. Which means he hasn't eaten in several days. And he is starving. And he says, man, if I don't get some food soon, I'm going to die. And Jacob goes, ah, moment of opportunity. I just happen to be cooking something here. I'll give it to you if you give me the birthright. And his brother goes, okay, I was going to die anyways. So if you don't give me the food, I'll die. So I might as well give you the food because if I died anyways, I wouldn't get the birthright. So you might as well have it. I need food. And he got the birthright. And he's going around, well, that worked. I'm good at this. There was a second thing. 
It was called the blessing. And what the father would do when he knew he was getting close to dying, he would call in the oldest son and pronounce a blessing on him. And he would say, God's going to bless you in these ways. And these wonderful things will happen. And they believed that they would happen. And so getting the blessing was a greatly coveted thing because it would kind of set forth a very good future for you. And Jacob wants that. And so one day his brother, his, his brother dad calls him in and says, I, I want to pronounce the blessing on you, but please go and kill me a deer because I love your fresh venison. Cook it up, bring it to me, and I'll give you the blessing. Schemer mom was listening in and she goes, oh no. And she takes Jacob aside and says, you know what? We got to get the blessing. So Esau was this very hairy guy. And that's all we're told about him. He was red and hairy. So mom says, here's what we're going to do. Esau is outside all day. His clothes smell like the outdoors. So I want you to go and get one of his robes and put it on. But because he's <clears throat> very hairy, Dad's go Dad was blind at this point. He's going to want to feel you to make sure it's Esau. So go kill a sheep. And I'm going to glue sheep wool on your arms so you're hairy. And we're going to trick Dad. Because now you're going to smell like your brother. You're going to feel like your brother. Try to sound like your brother. So Jacob goes in because his mom had cooked up the sheep and she made it taste like wild venison. And so he goes in and he says, Dad, I, I'm back. I had a successful hunting trip. I got your venison. Give me the blessing. Dad goes, something's not feeling right here. That was awful quick. So he says, come close to me. And he smells them and he puts his hands on them. Says it feels like Esau, smells like Esau, doesn't sound like Esau. So he says, what's your name? He says, I'm Esau. And dad believes him, gets sucked in. Gives the blessing to Jacob. Shortly right after it was done, Esau comes back. And he realizes that his brother tricked him out of the, the blessing. And he is so hurt, so angry. He said, my dad's soon going to die. Soon as my dad is dead, I'm going to kill Jacob. That's how much I now hate him. Because he's tricked me out of everything of value in my life. So that was the first clue that Jacob got that being a manipulator had bad consequences. Because now his mom says to him, I overheard what Esau said, he's planning to kill you. You got to escape. I want you to go to a different country, but my brother lives there. Go and live with him. So because of his manipulation, he just broke up his family. Because of his manipulation, he caused his dad tremendous pain, his brother tremendous pain, and now he's going to leave his mom and cause her tremendous pain. Do you think he might have said, wow, maybe manipulation isn't a good idea? No. No. He goes to his uncle and he says, I'd like to work for you. And his uncle has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. Leah's name means cow. So that should tell you a little bit about her. She's ugly. Rachel was a 10 plus. So Jacob goes to his uncle and he says, I will work to you for you. I want to marry your, your daughter, his cousin. And he says, well, there's a dowry price. He says, tell me how many years I got to work, to work for you for free uh, and I'll, I'll get Rachel. His uncle says, seven years. He says, okay, I'll work seven years for free. My payment will be I'll marry Rachel. So he works seven years. He's all excited. Wedding night comes in that culture. You don't see the bride and she's heavily veiled. So he forgets that his uncle is an even better hustler than him. And so his uncle takes Leah, cow, puts her in the wedding dress with the heavy veil and marries her to Jacob 
Imagine in the wedding night in the bedroom, taking the veil off and going, oh my goodness. The shoe is now on the other foot. He now knows what it's like to be tricked, to have a manipulator outsmart you. Do you think he said, okay, I'm done with manipulation. This costs too much pain. No, you want to know what he did? He says, you think you're smart, uncle? I'm smarter than you. And the contest was on. And for the next, because he said, I'm going to work seven more years for Rachel. So he ended up marrying both sisters. Imagine the con conflict that caused. But he worked another seven years and he did manipulation after manipulation until he got more wealthy than his uncle. But he had to trick his uncle out of a bunch of things until one day he hears through a servant that his uncle is planning to kill him. Well, there you go. Think that will come up? No. What does it take to get through to a manipulator? In his mind, he's still got a few more tricks in his bag. So he says, well, I, I'll just take all my wealth, all my servants, all of my livestock, my two wives and their servants, and we'll go back to my mom's place. And we'll go back and live with mom. So that's what he does. Problem. To get back to mom, he's got to cross territory now owned by his brother Esau. And there's no way to go around it. I think his heart fluttered a little bit, but he said, not a problem. I can work Esau again. So what he does is he gets a whole bunch of his servants and he says, we are going to give hundreds of gifts to Esau. And I want there to be a line of you, one taking a goat, one taking a camel, another goat, another camel. And it's going to be like a two-mile line. And he's just going to get gift after gift after gift. And surely after that, he's going to say, oh, my brother's so wonderful, I'll let him pass through. Do you want to know what happens? He gives all the gifts. And then the servants come back and he says, um, he's bringing 400 armed men. Oops, that didn't work. Now, all of a sudden, Jacob is out of tricks. None of his manipulation is going to work. So he's back into a corner. So that's the first thing I want you to see. A manipulator will never change until he has no more tricks and he's backed into a corner. But Jacob thinks he's got one more trick. God, I need you. I'm going to manipulate God now. I'm going to get really good and religious right now so that God will come and fix the problem. Do you want to know what he found out? God doesn't get manipulated. And so what happened, we're told, is they, he wrestled all night with God. A big wrestling match. And finally he realized he wasn't going to be able to manipulate God, so he had one option left. Trust God or die. You want to know what it takes to get a manipulator to get to trust? they got to be in a world of pain with no options left but to trust. Now they don't trust happy like. They trust kicking and screaming. They trust because it's the last thing they want to do, but it's the only option they have left. That's the only way they learn to trust. Now I want you to understand a couple of things. When God is wrestling with Jacob, when Jacob finally gets to the point where he says, okay God, bless me, God says this, what is your name? That would be two things that would have hit Jacob like a ton of bricks. Number one, what is your name? He would say, my name is Manipulator. Oh, that's become who I am. I'm not proud of that anymore. I've done a ton of damage now. I can't even get out of, wiggle out of all the damage I've caused and all the consequences. That's who I am. I am a mess. And then the second thing is, when was the last time Jacob heard those words? It's when his father said, as he felt him, and said, what is your name? He's taking him back to when all of this mess started. 
And he says, are you really sorry for the pain you caused your dad? Are you really sorry for what you did to your brother? Because if you're not sorry, you're not done manipulating. So he wasn't just out of options. He was now repentant for who he had become and for the damage and the hurt that, it, that he had caused. And that's where God brings us, but it is a painful path for a master hustler. Now there's one other thing. Guess what a master hustler would do? God would say, what was your name? And they say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll stop. And then life would start going smoothly again. And they'd start sliding back into being a hustler again. And getting their own way again. So guess what God did? He says, I don't want you just to depend and trust me today. i got to keep you dependent and trusting me for the rest of your life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put your hip out of joint. So that from now on, for the rest of your life, every day you'll walk with a limp and with pain. So every day you will have a reminder... Hustling's the wrong move. Trust is the right move. Guess what I think addiction is for many of you? Your hip out of joint. Because every day you get right in your face. You don't want to go back there. It's painful. Surrender and trust. And you want to know what happened with Jacob? He didn't get it perfectly overnight. He still fell into scheming once in a while. But he gradually trusted more and more and more so that at the end of his life, he was a man that passed to his children and his grandchildren that God can be trusted. That was his legacy that he passed on to his kids. So if you're a schemer, get ready for a bumpy road. Because God doesn't want to leave you in a place that hurts yourself and others. He wants to bring you to a place where you finally have a joy and meaningful relationships. But it's a place you're not going to want to go to because you've got to trust to be there. And so you've got to go through pain and run out of options before you finally 